In the past half a century, a considerable number of expertly researched critical editions of artist letters have seen the light. As we have just heard, uh, today's session celebrates a new addition to this body of work, uh, the publication of the Letters of Degas by my former professor and teacher, Theodore Reff. So <laughs> congratulations, um, Professor Reff, and kudos to the uh, Wildenstein Plattner Institute uh, for making this happen. Uh, perhaps now is a good moment uh, to assess what such additions have done for the field of art history. Certainly, they have contributed crucial details to the biographies of artists, details of their lives, their backgrounds, the cultural milieus in which they moved, the places they visited, the art they saw, etc. Oh, I didn't want to do that, so uh, let me so I'm leaving my paper on the computer. <clears throat> uh, they have also provided important documentation regarding the production of works of art, when, where, how, helping art historians to authenticate, date, and stylistically evaluate works of art and their place in an artist's oeuvre. And they have afforded much material to the new subdisciplines of the history of collecting and art market studies. But what have they done for the interpretation of art, for the interpretation of artworks? To be sure, artist letters have been mined for their author's pronouncements on work of art. And Elizabeth already reminded us that we cannot always trust uh, these pronouncements, of course. Uh, nevertheless, Gustave Courbet's letter to Jean Fleury on the left and Gauguin's letter to Daniel de Manfred about his painting, Where Do We Come From? Where Are We? Where Are We Going? may well be among the most often cited artist letters in the history of 19th century art. Letters have also been quarried for artist general statement on their artistic intention and philosophy. For the most part though, they have been considered as verbal aids to the analysis and interpretation of works of art, or to put it semiotically, as a signification system subservient to the signification system of art itself, one from which art historians are free to cherry pick parts useful to them in their analysis of works of art with a big W and a big A, but not always worthy of close reading in their entirety. In this paper, I want to make a plea for a reading of artist letters that is at once more holistic and more microscopic. I'm encouraging a way of looking at artists' letters and their works of art as equivalent signification systems that frequently intersect and in so doing mutually reinforce or enlighten one another. In the title of my paper, I have called this Reading Artist Letters as Thick Description. At the time I wrote the proposal, I meant by this the reading of artist letters as documents in which the letter writer tries to interpret the social discourse of his or her time to a more or less broad readership of family, friends, critics, etc. In retrospect, perhaps the title was a bit too clever. You know how that happens sometimes with <laughs> two proposals. What I meant it to express that when reading artist letters, we don't just pick out specific passages that deal with individual works of art or expound the artist's philosophy, but that we look at all the material contained within them in relation to all of the artist's creative work. When we do so, artist letters no longer are important or not important, depending on their content, but all have equal potential for enhancing our understanding of the artist and his work. The realization that such a new reading of artist letters might bear fruit came to me three years ago when a number of French scholars led by the psychoanalyst Yves Sarfati organized a symposium at the Musée d'Orsay that they entitled with a bow to Alexandre Dumas, uh, La Correspondance de Courbet 20 ans après, or The Correspondence of Courbet 20 years later, that means 20 years after the publication of the letters. The focus of the symposium was to see how the publication of the letters of Courbet 
had changed the commonly held perceptions of the artist as well as the views and interpretation of his work. Among the speakers were some well-known art historians, but also a philosopher, an anthropologist, a medical doctor, a psychoanalyst, and two historians. They all had looked at the letters from the point of view of their discipline and focused on aspects of their content that most art historians might have found negligible. Perhaps the most extreme case was the lecture by Dr. Philippe Godeberger, a proctologist <laughs> whose subject was the artist hemorrhoids and the, and the frequent references to them in the artist's letters all the way from 1839 to 1870 when he finally had them surgically removed. Uh, Godeberger uh, linked Courbet's hemorrhoids not only to his ever-increasing obesity, but also to his alcoholism and smoking, which eventually would lead to cirrhosis of the liver, a severe ascites, and ultimately the artist's death. You may well ask, what is the value of this for the understanding of Courbet's work? Uh, on a rather mundane level, Godeberger pointed to the presence of a pillow on Courbet's chair in the Atelier du Peintre, which incidentally, I have done a little research, is I think the only pillow that occurs in Courbet's work. Um, but other possibilities suggest themselves as well. Courbet's scholar Mary Morton several years before Godeberger's essay, was also struck by the numerous references to Courbet's problem in the letters not only to his family, but also to his friends. Based on that observation, she, she suggested that Courbet's famous paintings of the Source de la Loue, which for decades have been linked to the vagina, could also be linked to other bod bodily orifices. <laughs> Now, I leave it to Mary <laughs> or other scholars to elaborate on this. Suffice it to say here that the linking of the of this, uh, Sur de la Lue paintings to the vagina, initiated by the German scholar Werner Hoffmann and widely adopted by subsequent art historians, was largely based on a comparison of these paintings with the so-called Origine du Monde, of course not Courbet's original title, uh, that is what uh, Hoffman did was comparing two elements in the same signification system painting, but looking for, for elements in, in other systems such as the writing, we might really come to very different interpretive solutions and this is kind of really the point of my paper. Uh, to return to the uh, 20 ans après symposium, Psychoanalyst Yves Sarfati, based on a careful reading of Courbet's references to work, suggested that the artist, especially in his younger years, may have suffered from bipolar disorder. This would explain periods of lethargy alternating with periods of frantic activity. The letters of the end of 1849 and the beginning of 1850 are a very good example. On October 30, Courbet writes to Francis Way that he is, quote, frequently in a state of torpor, end quote. And a month later, on November 28, he writes to the same correspondent, quote, if after I left you are beginning to find me lazy, my God, what would you say now, end quote. But by December, he is at work on the Stonebreakers, and by March 10th, um, he, um, sorry, and by March 10th, he not only has finished that painting, but also the burial at Ornans, a canvas of about 10 by 22 feet with some 40 life-size figures. So you really see that alternation of you know, not doing anything and then frantic activity. No wonder that Courbet wrote on March 10th, again to Francis Way, that he is, quote, slaving away, end quote, and experiencing a sense of fatigue that, that he didn't think himself capable of. While Sarfati's observation does not help much with the interpretation of the stonebreakers or the burial, 
It may shed some light on Courbet's working method, his a la prima facture, and the near absence of preliminary studies. Both Goldberg and Sarfati looked at Courbet's letters in ways that, familiar as I was with these letters, I had really never thought about. They did so either by looking at passages that I had found completely negligible and irrelevant to an understanding of Courbet's art, or by paying attention to connections between the letters that also I had not really looked at. As a final example of the kind of close reading of artist letters that I'm advocating, let's turn to a letter by Courbet that is not in the edition published in the 1990s, but that has come to light more recently. It's a letter to Euphrasie Piéger, uh, the wife of the philosopher Pierre-Joseph Proudhon, dating some months after the letter's death in 1865. Courbet had finished painting the posthumous portrait of Proudhon, for the purpose of which he had borrowed some of the philosopher's clothes from his wife. The letter is short, so I read it to you in its entirety, and you also see it here on the screen. Madame, I'm very grateful to you for your kindness in sending me the clothes of my friend PJ. I have made his portrait as well as I could. I wanted to be able to make it as he deserves. Your portrait also needed to be in the painting, but the time I had between the death of PJ and the opening of the exhibition has not allowed me to paint it from nature. I hope that I can make arrangements with you later and that you will give me the pleasure of posing for a head study which will replace the one that is there provisionally. If you want to see the portrait of PJ, you can see it on May 1st, the day of the opening of the Salon in the Palais d'Industrie. I don't know whether I will be there because I'm traveling, which is the reason that I have not been able to respond to you until now. I will lend the clothes that you have selected for me. I will send the clothes that you have selected to me to Madame Veuve Proudhon in Burgil. Uh, the opening day of the painting will cause a lot, I'm sorry, the opening day of this painting will cause a lot of noise and there will be many people. Please send my best to the lovely young ladies and to your friends with my sincere and amicable greetings, Gustave Courbet. The letter presents interesting new insights into the genesis of Courbet's portrait of Proudhon and more generally, Courbet's creative endeavor. Through other letters, we already knew that Courbet painted the portrait of the philosopher immediately <coughs> after his death. He had long wanted to portray Proudhon but the latter had never agreed to pose. Now Courbet felt he could not wait. The portrait was at once an homage to a man he admired and considered his friend, but also an opportunity to exhibit a work that, as Courbet says in the letter to Proudhon's wife, would attract the public's attention due to Proudhon's recent death. And here, of course, you see the portrait that he painted originally uh, with the uh, Madame Proudhon and the provisional head uh, that he was going to repaint. Eventually he didn't do that and he just painted the empty chair of Madame Proudhon. <coughs> In the absence of a model, Courbet wrote several letters to friends to ask them to procure photographs of Proudhon as well as a death mask and a painted portrait he knew of by the Belgian artist Amide Bourson. Before the letter to Madame Proudhon was discovered, it was not known that Courbet also contacted her to request that she send him the, a set of his friend's clothes. This is interesting, I think, in several respects. First, it adds to our understanding of the bricolage method uh, of, the, of the painting of Proudhon's <coughs> portrait, in which the head was modeled after photographs, a portrait, and a death mask, while the body was done from a model or a dummy wearing Proudhon's clothes. It is interesting as well because it confirms Courbet's lifelong fascination with clothes, a theme that runs through his letters and is also visible in many of his paintings. But what strikes me most about the letter is Courbet's apparent insistence on using Proudhon's, Proudhon's own clothes rather than a set of clothes that would have resembled Proudhon's usual wear. It was well known at the time that the philosopher, especially in his leisure time, fancied the peasant's smock. 
Schmuck took him back to his youth in the Franche Comté, where he made extra money for his family by herding cows or pigs. Of course, the Schmuck also spoke of his political concerns with the poor and the disenfranchised. But such a white Schmuck as Proudhon wears in his portrait by Proudhon, uh, let alone the nondescript let me go back for a moment, let alone the nondescript blue pins and the felt hat would have been easy to find in Ornans where Courbet painted uh, Proudhon's portrait. Um, second. Courbet wore one himself in his painting, the meeting, you see the white smock, and there's many other examples, like for example, the grave digger in the, uh, in the burial. Um, well, let me go back for a moment to this. So why didn't he use another shirt? Uh, Courbet may have known that the worker shirt that Proudhon wore was not just any shirt. Uh, it was one that was given to him when he was incarcerated by a fellow prisoner from the Beauce region in northern France, a farmer by the name of Narcisse Besseteau. Uh, in a letter to his childhood friend, Dr. Maguet, written while he was in the prison of Saint Pelagie in 1849, Proudhon had expounded at length about this shirt, typical of the Beauce region, here and here you see the shirts worn by farmers in the Beauce region, which he argued shared the excellent quality of the region's foods. And this is what Proudhon wrote about the shirt. The blouses of the same make, I would almost say the same material as the regional pâté. It is altogether rustic with piping, solid and soft material. The story of Proudhon's shirt appears to have been well known in Proudhon's circle and may have been part of his lore. But I think it is not only the specificity of the shirt and its history, but perhaps also a tactile and perhaps even olfactory aspect that Courbet may have felt he needed to paint it, and by extension the portrait of Proudhon, in a manner that had some degree of authenticity, or as he put it to Madame Proudhon, in a manner her husband deserved. Much has been written about the tactile qualities of Courbet's landscape paintings, and it's often attributed to the artist's bodily presence in the landscapes he painted, which made him experience them with all of his senses, sight, feeling, smell, hearing, and perhaps even taste. Is it too far-fetched to think that this multi-sensory appreciation of the subject was also something Courbet required for other types of painting? That in the absence of a model, he tried to get a death mask where he could feel Proudhon's face and Proudhon's actual clothes which he could may perhaps even smell and also feel, to at least approximate the multi-sensory experience of Proudhon that he needed to paint his portrait in the way he felt Proudhon deserved it. I have discussed the example of Courbet's letter to Madame Proudhon in some detail to explain what I mean by reading artist letters as thick description. For too long, we have read the letters as thin description and analyzed them in systematic modes that focused on specific art historical issues, dates, provenance, expressions of the artist's philosophy of art, utterings about specific paintings. I advocate a reading of the letters in which we assume that anything can be meaningful and that there may be many more intersections between the letters and the works than we have traditionally assumed. Thank you. <laughs>